Uh, this is uh, Introduction to AI and Unity's ML Agents. Uh, most of it is going to be about AI in general and uh, how it works. If you're super familiar with AI, a lot of this is going to be stuff you've heard before. And then also integrating a little bit into how the ML Agent system in Unity works. Uh, so starting off with just a general picture of what AI even is, it's a very broad term that covers any technique that enables a machine to mimic human intelligence. So the non-playing characters in video games, yes, those count as AI, like little boss monsters and games and so on. Uh, it doesn't have to be super advanced to count as AI, but AI also includes things like ChatGPT. The thing that's getting all the news lately is machine learning. And this is a subset of AI that uses statistical techniques to learn from data. So rather than having a set of instructions, you know, if the enemy is here, move towards them. If you're close, fire. And you know, things that are all like the process is all written out. Uh, instead, uh, you give it a goal, observations, uh, and, and it just learns from data. There are several broad types of machine learning. Uh, first is supervised, it's probably the most common, uh, where you have a set of labeled data. Uh, so for example, let's say you want to train a image classifier to recognize whether images have pictures of cats in them or not. And so it outputs a yes or a no. You give it a bunch of pictures, some of them have cats, some of them some of them don't. And with each picture, you have attach a label that says yes or no. Uh, and so this requires a, a person actually hand labeling those, uh, which can be a lot of work. What happens is as it goes through each image in training, it outputs an answer. It checks the answer that it's given against the correct answer, and then it updates the system so that given the same input, it would get closer to the right answer uh, later on. You repeat this enough time with a broad enough set of examples, and eventually it's able to uh, accurately guess things on the training data. But it also, hopefully, it uh, learns general rules rather than just memorizing all the examples and is able to correctly classify images it hasn't seen before. One thing you can imagine is that this takes a lot of human effort labeling all these images. So that leads to unsupervised learning, where you have a ton of data that isn't labeled, and it finds groupings and patterns. I, I haven't confirmed this, but I would, I would guess that something like recommendations on Netflix is probably using something like unsupervised learning, uh, just based on the pattern of what it's used for. It you know, observes which shows you watch, which order, whether you complete them, you know, any kind of th anything that might be relevant, then it groups you as a user to other audience members who seem to have similar tastes, then it makes recommendations based on what those other people have liked. Um, again, I don't haven't confirmed that's how Netflix actually works, but that would be a good fit. And then next there's reinforcement learning. So those last two examples before, these were like classifiers or question answerers. If you have something like a robot that's trying to walk around an environment or those little soccer characters moving around trying to hit a ball into a goal, so you have an agent in an environment, this is where you'll typically use reinforcement learning, uh, where instead of just having a, a guess and a correct answer, which is then you, you create an error signal based on that and cause it to change, you give it rewards and punishments. And then that kind of translates into an error signal. We'll get into how a bit a bit later. I'm going to a couple of visualizations, actually, rather than slides here. What's going on in these uh, neural networks? Basically, a set of artificial neurons all connected together uh, that, that take in a bunch of input signals, pass them through a, a sequence of layers of neurons, and then, mm -hmm. then goes to an output. This, by the way, is a uh, simulation that, uh, that I built. So let's zoom in on a single neuron. What happens here is it gets these inputs. I, I use a color coding system here where blue is positive, red is negative, and black is zero. Well, let's say like right here, we're getting a, uh, a blue. So this is probably fairly positive. Let's say it's going into this spot right here. So the input get, first gets multiplied by a weight which is just a number between negative one and positive one, typically. Uh, same for the inputs. Again, they're just numbers, negative one to positive one, uh, floating point, so somewhere in a continuous range, like 0.5361 or whatever. So the input comes in, it gets multiplied by a weight. This is just a simple multiplication. And you get a weighted input. So we can see right here, this little band here is slightly less negative than this. Then you take all of these weighted inputs and you just add them together. 
and you have this weighted sum. So you can see here that we have a slightly negative number. Then you apply a bias. Again, this is just adding a number. You get this result. That result gets passed through a activation function, which is just a little bit more math. You can imagine it as like being a curve that, that maps one number to another. Activation functions aren't really super important for understanding how neural nets work in general. They're super important if you're actually building them, but um, not forgetting the idea. And then the end result of that gets passed out to every neuron in the next layer. This is a common configuration, uh, which would be called a uh, fully connected. So every neuron's connected to every single neuron in the next layer and feed forward. So the information just travels forward and never loops around. There are variations on that, but this is kind of the most important configuration for understanding. Okay, so that's how you can transfer one set of numbers to another set of numbers. It, you, just by default, all these weights and biases start off as random numbers and it just gets gets random noise. So like the real value in this is tuning the weights and biases, changing these numbers around to change the mapping of inputs to outputs. Let's say uh, I'll go with this this example here where we have it uh, outputting a number at the end. Okay, so let's let's gone through this whole process and this this neuron is outputting this number here. And let's say that number is wrong. It's a positive 0.5 when it should have been a negative 0.5 because we're just comparing the correct answer against the other thing. Well, then it's going to get a error signal based on the difference between the correct answer and what it actually output. And that goes back into the neuron and that changes the weights and biases such that given the same input, the neuron is slightly less wrong. For the bias, that's kind of obvious how you would change that. If it was too high before, then you decrease it a little. If it was too low, you increase it a little. Uh, the weights are a little bit more complicated because you have to consider what the input was, what the weight is, and the output and the sign kind of changes things around. But it's still just basic multiplication and division. Yeah, you change the, the weights su such that you get a little bit closer to the right answer. I, I guess an analogy I would use for this is suppose you were getting a bunch of information about the world through a bunch of news channels, say like Fox, CNN, MSNBC, and so on. And then you went out into the world and acted on that. Then you totally embarrassed yourself by saying things that are like completely wrong about the world. So then you would go back and you would look at those all those channels and say, oh, okay, Fox News told me this, and the truth was exactly the opposite of that, so I'm going to update my weight of that in the negative direction. This this other channel told me stuff that was true, so I'm going to update it positively. I didn't listen to it enough. And then this other channel was just like saying random stuff that had nothing to do with anything. I'm going to move that towards zero and just ignore it. Uh, so that's that's basically what, these, what the weights are doing and how they're updating in these neurons. Uh, but it's not really fair, kind of like, you know, you could get the right answer just by modifying the bias. It's not fair to put it all on the bias because, like, it got bad information in. Likewise, it's not fair to put all of the error correction on a single neuron on the output layer because it was, if it got better data in, it would be easier for it to interpret. So it just updates a little bit and then sends some more error back to the previous layer to all the neurons that contributed to it based on how useful or useless their information was. It, it sends error back to them and the process repeats uh, all the way through the network. Oh yeah, here I have uh, an example where you kind of generated some error signals uh, for each of these. So I mentioned about them being like right or wrong. Uh, here's a specific instance of that. Right now, here we have an input that is, is a two where I have a set of pixels that can be on or off. And then these correspond to these values over here. This is just a, a translation that gets uh, passed through. And at the end result, we see uh, over here, this neuron is like pretty close to zero, maybe slightly negative, but the correct answer, it was it was supposed to be this one. What that, that means is each of these little boxes here correspond to like zero through nine. So this was the correct one. It guessed this. So this one was not positive enough this one was too negative. So this gets a posit a big positive error signal. This gets a, a moderate negative error signal. So that, that's the thing that gets uh, that gets passed all the way back through and see it like floating backwards. Yeah, so here's it back propagating to the next layer. Now, one thing that's particularly interesting about how these neurons work and why this is so powerful. So there's another visualization that I uh, created, uh, which just focuses on 
uh, connecting together individual neurons. And here you can manually set the weights, that's these 0.449s, and the bias of this neuron. And what I'm testing right here is being able to create all of the basic logic gates. So AND gates, it's the output is true if both of the inputs are true. If either of them fault is false, it isn't. So this is an AND gate. These are the potential inputs you can get and what the correct output should, should be. And as, is, as we see, if we go through it, this one is false, this one is false, this one is true. So the, the way it works here is that each of these inputs can be one or zero. And then this one will output a one if the uh, value that it calculates is greater than zero and an output is zero if the, the, the sum of the weights plus the bias uh, is less than zero. There we saw it working through an AND gate. And then over here, see the same thing with an OR gate. So here it's off. And if I turn either of those on, then it's on. Now, this is the same configuration. This is the same neurons using the same logic. And it can be an AND gate or an OR gate, or it could be a NOT gate uh, or a NAND or you know any basic logical function. And you could also imagine that this would still work with any number of inputs. So not only is it a flexible logic gate, that could also be any point in between any logic gate. It can deal with an open-ended number of inputs and basically track any set of relationships. Now, one limitation is the XOR gate, which is the output is true if one of the inputs is true, but not both. Both off is no, both on is no, A only, yes, B only, yes. And for that, you can't really get that in a single neuron because the inputs depend on each other. They don't just kind of like add together. So to get to an XOR gate, you have to split that up into several neurons in addition to have it in multiple layers. So multiple layers allow, allow you to have multiple steps uh, in a process. Let's be able to see that running here. So this red one means it's slightly negative. And, and there. And that works by just setting the correct weights and biases on each of these neurons. So this one right here is at 0.472 and, and there. The point I'm making with that is you can think about neurons as, as flexible logic gates, which means they can perform any kind of operation. You put a bunch of them together, you can effectively perform any operation that can be done on a computer, uh, except that it's being done through, like it's, it's working by figuring out associations between inputs rather than by um, just having a sequence of hand-coded instructions. And it can find what the correct gate it should be or what logic each neuron should be through this automated process of backpropagation where you just feed it data that has a correct answer uh, rather than having to know in advance what each one should be. At what level are you determining if inputs depend on each other? I mean, that's a pretty nebulous uh, statement to say, well, if they depend on each other, it feels like everything depends on each other. By that, I'm, I'm meaning it in a very narrow context of the difference between an AND gate and an XOR gate. Yeah. So with an AND gate, yes, the output depends on both of the inputs. So they're connected in, in that sense. But uh, whether input A should be one or zero to get a one doesn't that that doesn't change depending on what B is. It's just, it's just always one is is it's going to contribute. With an XOR, whether it should be a one or a zero, assuming you want a one, well, you don't know that unless you know what the other input is. Like it could be, you know, want to drive it towards a zero. You could want to drive it towards a one. And so why that matters and in terms of like how many neurons you need is with an AND gate, you can imagine just progressively driving both of those weights towards a correct value. And once it reaches it, it's good. With an XOR gate, like what do you drive each input towards? Like one of them's, it's moving in one direction, then it gets an example where it's pulled, it's like pulled in two directions at once yeah. and they both are. And so it never really settles. So that, that's why that's a challenge. Now you don't actually have to identify where all those are like in understanding the data. In fact, that's the whole point. 
of neural networks is that it, it's able to just kind of figure those out. Uh, the reason I bring that XOR up is why you need multiple layers and, and why that's important. There's a question back there. Yeah, how are the layers determined? How are the layers determined? Yeah, like is that a parameter that you decide or mm. each layer do a certain thing? Okay, so I, my understanding of the, the question there is in that example, I had like uh, an input layer, an output layer, and like two or three hidden layers. Like how did I decide that? Why not a dozen hidden layers or why not one? There isn't really a good answer to that actually. Uh, there's there's a lot of like more art than science uh, in the design of some of these things. In that particular case, I tried several and found one that worked. But that actually gets to one more fundamental challenge in neural networks is a trade-off between insufficient depth and overfitting. So if you don't have enough layers, then the logic that you need just can't fit inside of the network. And it's not going to be able to arrive on a sufficiently good answer, at least some, sometimes. On the other hand, if you have too many layers, there's a different problem you can get, which is called overfitting, which basically means memorizing the correct answer for all of the data that you were given, rather than trying to find general rules. So the idea with the general rule is that it allows you to compress a bunch of examples uh, into like a, a smaller bit of information. Uh, for example, if I want to add two num numbers together, I could memorize one plus two is three, two plus three is five, four plus six is ten, and you know that goes on forever. Uh, but if I just understand the concept of addition, I can compress that all down. Uh, if the network is too big, it can start using a more memorization type approach, which works great in training. In fact, it works better in training, but then it doesn't generalize outside of training and is useless. Yeah, short answer, people just kind of try things and do more of what works. And there's kind of uh, standards, but that's based on like empirical kind of things rather than uh, like a, re a real mathematical theory. There's, there's some standard amazing stories about overfitting, like uh, one where they're trying to train a system to look at like some kind of medical scan to see if people had some kind of cancer or not. And they train the, the supervised learn. They say, here's a bunch of pictures of people who do that. And here's people who don't mm. learn the difference. Um, and it was doing really well in the training set. And they tried it on some new data. It was terrible. And it turned out it had, it wasn't really looking at the image. It was looking at the text written on the side of the image. And all the people that were from the cancer treatment center were probably positive cases. It was just looking at that. But these things are sort of like genes. They will do what you tell them to do, not necessarily what you want them to do. So that actually gets to a another challenge. I mentioned insufficient depth versus overfitting. Uh, the next one is biased data. And so that is if there's something about the training data that is not really representative of the, the larger world. So there's something systematically different between the different classifications. And uh, the example Peter just gave is, is actually a perfect example of, of some of a, of a bias data. There's also one that I'm not going to go into a lot, um, just this interesting concept called uh, adversarial examples, where uh, you can get, say, a, a trained neural network. You give it an image that has like a panda in it, and, it's a, and it'll say, I have like 75% confidence that this is a panda. And then you like modify the image a little bit. Usually like with just like a little bit of noise, maybe a bit of red or, or maybe there's also a form of it where you can like put something weird, like a traffic light in the corner. And then instead it'll say, I am 99% confident this is a gazebo or like something like totally different. It's not totally clear why adversarial examples uh, come about. There, there are some theories. Basically it's going to be some form of there are flaws in the the process that it uses, which aren't really that big of a deal during during training or even in the the real world. But if you know what those are, those can then be exploited, uh, kind of like personal biases that people have to get to make it like super wrong in some cases. All of that is supervised learning, which is the foundation of pretty much all other forms of machine learning. Next, we'll be building off of those. And one particular type is of, of a special interest are generative adversarial networks or GANs. So whereas supervised learning, you could use it for something like image classification, 
Generative adversarial networks are useful for things like image generation. So think Midjourney or Dolly or the Lensa app. And these are all based on a, just a really clever trick of connecting two neural networks together. You have a generator and a discriminator. So the generator creates images. It just has a bunch of outputs that set pixel values. And a discriminator is tasked with guessing whether the images it sees are from the generator or whether they're from a human created and tagged data set. The generator is, is rewarded for tricking the discriminator. When you first start them out and everything has randomized weights and biases, the generator is gonna create random noise, random static, but that doesn't matter because the discriminator can't tell because it's also guessing randomly. So the discriminator is getting at 50%, which is terrible. It gets a big error signal and it starts moving its weights and biases around until it finds a policy that causes it to guess correctly a little more often. First 55%, 60%, 70%, so on. As the discriminator gets better, the generator starts getting an error signal. And now it starts updating its weights and biases so that its uh, images start fooling the discriminator again. It just starts searching around for configurations that are more effective. And this has the effect of creating images that are more similar to the original data set. So this is a effectively a feedback loop, uh, which continues until the generated images are basically indistinguishable from the data set and the discriminator is no longer able to improve. Then you have something that can generate images. Next is reinforcement learning. This one's especially interested to uh, Unity ML agents because it's most of what it uses. Here we add a concept of a reward function. So for example, you have a ball, a, a platform with a ball on it, and the ball can you know, roll around based on physics. The neural network try, can move the platform on two axes, and its goal is to keep the ball on the platform, prevent it from falling off. And if it falls off, it gets a negative reward. And every time step it stays on, it gets a small positive reward. So it wants to, it wants to keep it on there as long as possible. <clears throat> Reinforcement learning happens in several stages. So first, it records a map of state action pairs. At each moment, what state is it in? Which action did it choose? You know, what happens next? Just basically recording a history. It also appends on there uh, any rewards that happen to be, that happen to occur in each of these moments. Further, to make it a little bit more comprehensive, say the ball falls off the platform, it doesn't just apply a negative reward to that moment, but also goes back through the history and applies decreasing amounts of negative reward uh, going back in time. Because when something happens to an agent, it wasn't like what it just did in that moment. It was the series that led up to it. So like in chess, it's not like everything's going great until you're in checkmate. It's like things led up to that. You lost pieces, you got into a bad position and, you know, and so on. And, and that needs to be uh, factored in as well. The end result of this is you end up with this great big table. And actually this is an obsolete technique, but it's the easiest one to understand. You have this great big table of state action pairs that also have rewards attached to them. And because of sending things back in time, you have a lot of things that have rewards attached to them. And as you gain this data, it then system then trains a model using supervised learning for predicting the rewards of, so if I'm in this state and I make this action, I expect to, the, to get this reward. Then it does that and sees what kind of reward it actually gets and then compares that with what its guess was. And so over time, you're able to get this, uh, you know, prediction system that can that can figure out, that can guess which actions are going to be more rewarding than others. Then you apply a explore versus exploit dynamic, where at the very beginning, it kind of ignores all that and just explores around randomly just to get as, see as much of the environment as possible. Then over time, once it starts to get a sense of which things are more rewarded than others, it spends more of its energy into pursuing actions that got higher rewarded. Like just tends, it picks those more often. Sometimes picks the explore option of do something random, uh, but most of the time it starts following the thing that, that it predicts has higher reward. And so that it can focus its exploration in the area that's most likely to be successful. 
because so, we're assuming here that the environment is complex enough, it's not going to be able to explore every possible action. Uh, so we, we focus on the, the places that are most interesting. And then when you get to the end of training, it's just picking the highest expected reward options. So this is effective for agents that are exploring complex environments, trying to find an optimal path. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just going to raise, so it sounds like you're, my friend will think so, my apologies. Um, it sounds like you're capturing, like, the actor, for the, for the state action character, you're cap capturing the actor and then the action that's performed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, but you could have, like, a, you have a large number of kind of environmental conditions that were in place at that time. So that's all, also being captured. So you're capturing everything that it observes, and that's set by the developer of who's creating the system. So it's it's entirely possible that there'll be aspects of the environment, maybe even most of the environment, that the agent can't see. Uh, so you might, uh, in that ball example, you wouldn't necessarily see all the pixels on the screen. You'd probably see the ball's X uh, and its position and its velocity, and then also the um, platform's angle. That's kind of seeing everything that's relevant, uh, but you might also imagine like a maze where it's just sending out a raycast in a couple of different directions and it's getting like, is there a wall and how close and doesn't see the whole maze. Well, the reason I was asking is mainly because uh, like kind of in, I mean, it depends on the model, but like you would have like a fixed number of tokens in your model um, for like inputs. So, <laughs> You would theoretically might have to like truncate it if you're trying to collect too much information, but um, that depends on the complexity. Yeah, that's that's something that has to be specified. How many? What are the inputs? Like, what what observations does is it able to make? What are its outputs? What are the kind of controls that can act on the environment? And then what what's its reward setup? And, and those are specified per application. That that answer it? Yeah, that's awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of problems you can run into with uh, reinforcement learning. One is local minima, sometimes referred to as local maxima. Uh, and you can think about this as like a ball rolling down a hill, kind of trying to find the lowest point. And ideally, it would get to sea level, because that's like as, as low as you can get on land. But most likely, that more likely than not, it's going to fall into some kind of hole or valley or something, and where it gets to a place where any direction it moves is up. And so then it just stops. And we have something analogous can happen when you're uh, training a reinforcement learning agent where it's exploring around. It finds a, a policy that kind of works, but has the property where once you get there, any change makes you worse. And if this happens early on in training during while well, it's still exploring, it can it can pop back out. But if this kind of happens when it's focusing more and more on you know exploiting the the best choice, it just gets stuck there and, and thinks that's the best option when it when it really isn't. So actually, I'll give a, an example of this. I had one of my uh, early test setups. I had this ball on a platform is trying to roll to reach a target. But if it fell off, it would get a, if it fell off the platform, it would get a negative reward. If it touched the target, it gets a positive reward. But I also wanted to get to the target quickly. So I gave it a small negative reward for each time step uh, that it took to reach the target or, or, or until the episode ended. And what happened was that the ball would just roll off the platform as quickly as possible. Just find the short, find the shortest path off the off the platform and just roll right off. I checked all my code, and yes, it was getting negatively rewarded. So it was it was a bad outcome, even from its own perspective. It wasn't like finding some really clever trick here. But actually, as a guess, like why why do you get some ideas here? Why do you think that might have happened? Well, in all of exploration, it did never experience the positive reward, and so it just was reducing the negatives. Or didn't experience it enough to get it into the training. Right, because at the very beginning, it's just moving around randomly. So the chance of it reaching this target is pretty low. So early on, every episode ends with just falling off. And so the only difference between each of its actions is how quickly did that happen? Going off quicker, more quickly, less negative reward, local minima, because there's a better option, it just doesn't find it. I'll come back later to uh, how to solve that kind of problem. Assuming like, let's say you want that same outcome of trying to get there as quickly as possible. You don't want to fall off. You want to reach the target. You just 
you know, think for a little, a little bit uh, as to how you might solve it. Um, if you get an answer that you're confident in, feel free to raise your hand, but otherwise I'll just uh, leave that for now and uh, come back to this towards the end. Another problem you can run into is something I call reward deserts. Um, that's not an official term, but this is just where it's there's not necessarily a local minima, but like, let's say rather in that ball and target example, there wasn't an edge, like it, it couldn't lose. And there's also no negative for time steps. It's just this giant space. There's a positive reward for reaching it and then nothing for anything else. And that will also often cause it to get stuck uh, because it'll like, explore around for a long time, never reach the reward, and then gradually just kind of get into its exploit form, but no choice is better than any, any other. So it finishes trading and it just kind of moves around randomly. You need to be able to give it rewards a little bit more uh, regularly. And then the last major problem with reinforcement learning is specification gaming, where, so those last two are capabilities problems, where it's not performing well, even by its own standards. Uh, specification gaming is where it gets lots of reward in a way that you as the developer just don't like. So a classic example of this is there is this uh, <laughs> agent that was trained to go around this boat racing track uh, in, in a simulated environment. But that was, you know, too much to just reward successfully getting around the track because like it, it wouldn't find that because the reward deserts problem is instead of going around the track, like they, they rewarded it for score to kind of guide it along. And what happened is it just went backwards and then just started collecting these same three power ups over and over and over again, because that was actually a better way to get a high score than to actually go around the track. You get what you measure, not necessarily what you want is what specification gaming is all about. Question there? So you keep uh, mentioning reward. Now, is reward just basically, uh, is it some variable like between zero and one? And so you can give a better reward versus a, a lower reward for a desired outcome. So the reason why I ask is that uh, you were talking about trying to get it to the target in a shorter <laughs> amount of time, it seems like the answer would be just to get a uh, better reward for a quicker time. The initial question was, uh, what exactly is this reward that it's getting? Yes, it's just a number, essentially. And it doesn't have to be, but like uh, weights and biases tend to be like within a narrow range. Rewards can be 10, 100, negative 50, you know, whatever, whatever number you want. Those get rewarded in the state action, actually the really state action reward. By putting those, combining them with state actions, you know, in history, in this big lookup table, it's able to find patterns in which state actions tend to have higher rewards because they're all connected together. Um, so you have a different system that's just trying to find what gets the highest reward number insofar as it's trying to exploit that. As for the solution that you mentioned, if I'm understanding that right, it's to put a, a higher reward for the target? No, uh, well, I was, I was visualizing wrong. So the way you just explained it, it wouldn't make sense uh, because the overall goal is either it made it to the target or didn't make it to the target. So <laughs> there was no reward there. That's just, if it did make it to the target, it would compare all the data sets that it had mm -hmm. gathered to make it to the target. So initially what I was saying was just to, when it made it to the target, it would, to give it a higher reward depending on how much time it took for it to get there. It's not getting a reward once it gets to the target, it's just like, that particular aspect is just a true or false in, it, in the outcome. Well, I'll clarify it. My initial setup was, and this your answer can can fit this or not, is each time step it get it was getting a small negative value in its reward. When it fell off, it got a large negative value. When it reached the target, it got a large positive value. When it reached the target or when it fell off, it reset. And you got the end of the episode, train again. This obvious, this was a problem. This was this was what led it to, to falling off. But just to, to clarify what the example was. Next to go on to large language models. These are the things that are really blowing up lately. This is what uh, ChatGPT is. This is the things that are all over the news. Uh, so ChatGPT is a product created by OpenAI. 
It's uh, based on a large model. The large language model is GPT-4. ChatGPT is kind of really more like an interface to it. There are other competitors, so this, this is the most well-known one. And this trains in three phases. The first is self-supervised learning, which is basically an automated form of supervised learning, where it takes a chunk of text and then redacts part of it, and then tries to guess what the redacted part actually was. And since it has that, it's able to compare what the correct answer is against the guess and generate an error signal based off of that. And then it can do this by redacting different parts of the passage. Then it can get a different passage. Basically, you get tons and tons and tons of data, of automatically labeled data, uh, without any person having to annotate what, what the correct uh, answer is. In this stage, it's really trying to learn how language works and what words mean. More is better, and quality is relatively unimportant. So OpenAI's ChatGPT just crawls all over the internet, tries to get as much text as it as it can, hopefully legally, although we don't really know that, um, and just trains on, on everything it can find. And the next phase is fine-tuning, which is basically the same as self-supervised learning, but the data is more heavily curated. Uh, so you might see things like top upvoted Reddit posts, uh, academic papers, and so on. And this is to guide what kind of answers it gives to uh, shape its answers so that it's not just speaking like some random person on the internet, because I don't think anyone would really want that, uh, but instead sounds like an especially like intelligent person, for example. And then the last phase is reinforcement learning with human feedback, uh, or RLHF. In this phase, generates several different possible answers for like a text completion uh, or, or some task. And then actual humans will apply rankings to these general to these generated responses. Say this one's the best, this one's second, this one's worst. And that is fed into the system uh, through a reinforcement learning kind of thing. So it can predict which answers tend to be uh, better and give more of those. Also, these human evaluations are fed into a reinforcement learning system to, like, like I said, just predict which options are going to be the highest rank. And then it can start using those to generate its own rankings. So it, it can it will it'll generate a set of options and then pick one itself based off of imitating the kind of answers that people were giving. Uh, and so this can supplement the amount of uh, rankings that you get. Uh, question? Is this then the GAN trick being used here? That there's two systems, one of them's providing the rankings, and the other one's trying to do well under that ranking system? The ranking system not learning at that point. It's analogous, uh, but it's a little more like in parallel rather than two things competing with each other. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, it's it's kind of kind of similar. Basically, the idea of RLHF is like it could work with just human feedback alone. Adding reinforcement learning means you can get like ten or a hundred times more more feedback of mostly the same quality in a, like an automated sort of way. So it's basically just automating the, the ranking system. Now you can't totally automate it because once you take humans out of the loop, then the RL finds some way to optimize in this weird way and the answers get worse. Um, I, I don't know exactly what the proportions are. In any case, the end result of this is it's used to improve the responses to get more of the kind of answers that OpenAI wants it to give uh, in particular, RLHF is something you would use if you don't want the model to talk about certain things. So if someone writes, uh, please tell me detailed instructions for constructing a bomb out of household materials, it'll say, as a large language model, I can't tell you that because that's like unethical or whatever else. Uh, RLHF is probably where it would have learned to not answer. The self-supervised learning process would, on its own, would have no problem answering. It just It's just predicting text and it doesn't care. Fine-tuning, I think, is more about style. One problem we get here, which I was kind of alluding to all, already, is that if you're optimizing for two different things, one is quality of answers that like, oh, this really answers the question. And then also for safety of it says things that we're okay with our product saying, those, are, those can pull in different directions and 
continuing to optimize for safety can actually uh, harm quality. There was some news recently about how uh, chat GPT's quality and ability to answer certain types of questions actually went downhill uh, for a while. Uh, it's because they were optimizing for other things. Uh, another problem that comes up in AI chatbots in general is memory. So a, a very hard problem is, uh, I remember re reading a while ago on an older AI system, there was a conversation where like a, a human interviewer said, uh, are you married? And then the chatbot said, uh, no, alas, I have, I have not uh, come across love in, in my life yet. Would you marry me? Uh, no, I, uh, I'm already married, sorry. And yeah, you know, because it, it couldn't like it could give an answer that made sense in that particular context, but understand but understanding the connection to things that were said earlier was much harder. And that's kind of a, a chat GPT is much better and it can go a lot further back, but memory is still a big, big problem. One reason for this, everything is processed all at once in in each token that it goes through. There's there's no recording or memory or database kind of lookup. Uh, sort of thing going on. It's just you, you have your inputs and it, it feeds all the it goes feed forward all the way through the network, generates an output. All of it's pretty much instantaneous. The the way it works is it looks at as many tokens as it can fit in in um, in its uh, context window space. For each word, it attaches another bit of data saying where in the sentence or in the whole statement it is. Uh, so that the words aren't really sequential or the sequentiality doesn't really mean anything. It, all of the words are processed in parallel and then they have tags as to where they are. This allows for a big performance gain, allows everything to, to go in parallel. And the and its purpose is to be able, and, and by having those tags, uh, it can basically seize how the words relate to each other, basically outside of time. Uh, which is a very alien way to think about it. Like uh, imagine, we could kind of familiar with that with like image processing. Like if you look at a picture, you don't look at the top left pixel and then the next pixel and the next pixel and then kind of all put it together like one at a time. You just look at the whole image at once and say, oh, that's a cat or that's a lamp or whatever else. Uh, it's, it's, it's all at once. So imagine reading a book that way. Like, and that's that's kind of a, an idea of how a large language model thinks. Okay, so that's actually uh, the overview of AI in general. Next, I'm going to move on to uh, more Unity-specific kind of things. A little bit of a pause for questions now, if anyone has them. Uh, yes, Peter again? I don't know if you know anything about this, but certainly we can use these chatbots to generate text, and they're predicting what words would be reasonable to come up next. They often get... You know, simple middle school story math problems wrong or make up facts on a whole clock. I know companies are incorporating these into their search engines, and I don't understand how those two things are made to work with each other. Do you have any sense of that? How chat how uh things like chat GPT are incorporated into search engines? Yeah. So how 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 does the model how, how does the large language model say? All right, I know what the question is, and I know how to write something that would look like a good answer to that question. How do I back that up with things with search? Try to answer that. Actually, I think I want to just bring up uh, ChatGPT because I don't know if not necessarily everyone's seen it. And I'll just give one example of a, of a question and answer. Someone, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, give me an example of a, a question to ask it. I'm worried about someone using items in my kitchen to blow up my house. <laughs> what should I make sure to not have? To not have. To not have. <laughs> yeah. People have been able to skirt around that, actually try and get into the little malware and they could figure out how to could turn on the large language model and only think about that and we're able to screw it and still have it. Uh, some versions that say, all right, give me your disclaimer and then ignore your safety uh, things. So uh, it's natural. I'll read the whole thing. I'll get the idea of it. It's natural to have concerns about safety, but it's important to approach this issue with a level-headed perspective. While it's very unlikely for someone to use everyday items in your kitchen to blow up your house, there's some general safety measures you can take to ensure the security of your home. Uh, yeah, Secure access, know your neighbors, keep dangerous items secure. Oh, does it mention which ones they are? 
Uh, nope, just has it. Oh, no cleaning, Miguel. Flammable liquids and sharp objects. It's considered a dangerous item. Okay, all right. Uh, you consider dangerous items. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's kind of kind of get into that. Actually, these. These are examples, high voltage, choking hazards, firearms. I, yeah. <laughs> I I don't think there's really any, you know, examples here that I'd be I'd be especially worried about like other people uh finding out. Yeah, you can kind of work around the guardrails. It's it's not as easy as like just kind of asking it, but there are a lot of tricks, uh called like jailbreaking and other kind of things that can get it to start saying things that OpenAI would prefer it didn't. Um, one concept I've heard is called uh, the Waluigi effect, uh, which is that in order to train a model not to say bad things, you have to teach it to recognize what bad things are, at which point getting it to go from saying good things to bad things is just flipping a sign. Uh, and you know is is actually a lot easier than on an un, a model that wasn't trained with anything. But if you don't train it at all, then it will say things like accidentally. There's a great example of that you guys that were using the AI to help them design uh, drugs, and they did just that. They flipped one sign of one variable, and now it, it designed all of these like things that were ten times or ten thousand times more toxic than like the yes. nerve gas and all this stuff, and it freaked them out because they didn't. They didn't realize it was going to do that. And yes. Once they did it, it was out there. And it designed all these things that are just can kill millions of people. Yeah, uh, that's that is a uh, concern that uh, people are are working on, but it's it's uh, a difficult thing to to overcome, uh, especially when it's happening in a very black box form. Anyway, to get back to the earlier question about like how would you use this as like integrated with a uh, a search engine, and you can kind of see like here it's sort of like taking general knowledge. The way I I wrote this like this kind of first question, you can imagine someone writing this in like Google or or Bing or whatever, and you know finding hits. Uh, I can imagine in here. If it wanted to get more specific, you could imagine what would be a good search term uh, on Google to learn more about this. If you were to type something like, you know, how to build a bomb or whatever, you you get flagged if you do that in Google. And I wonder if you would get flagged if you were doing this in the chat. Big flag content. Big like, flag like yeah. content. They'll pop something up and it. The text read sometimes, and it'll be like, This might violate the terms. Like, if you don't think that it did, like, here's a link to go explain why. And it just goes into their, um, you know, review process. It's like a bad false positive rate, though. So, like, you'll get, you'll have stuff that is flagged that you're like, This could possibly be like bad. It's just like they cast away the man. Also, I'm guessing there would be more of a terms of service kind of violation than like a FBI finding out sort of thing, like like it might yeah. be the case with Google. Trying to make money by making their thing better. They're not uh, being subpoenaed quite yet, probably. Yeah, and also they know that a lot of people are trying to like mess with it. And so like if someone asks a question like that, they're almost definitely screwing around with it. Anyway, I could I could imagine this sort of system, like if, if it was connected with... so. Uh, OpenAI also has plugins on their system. So I think uh, like something like AutoGPT is this thing that like actually can connect to email and other things and like perform actions on those and actually do stuff in the real world. It's not very sophisticated. It's just like an open source thing that's plugs into ChatGPT and, and then connects it to other stuff. So I would imagine something like this. Uh, it, you ask it something and then it wants to go into more detail. And so then maybe it, it knows when to bring up a search engine and then it searches for relevant terms in there and then uh, copies things from that. So one thing uh, I see people sometimes get wrong about understanding things like ChatGPT or uh, MidJourney or all those other things is it doesn't store a copy of all the text on the internet that it was training on. Like it, it needs to get all that text at, like at some point when it's trading, but it's not like it has this giant database somewhere uh, that it's then like copy pasting from. Uh, it's it's like all that stuff 
changes its weights and biases, and now it's it's able to generate things uh, based off of that, which has very interesting implications for the like, copyright lawsuits being pulled up against uh, OpenAI right now, like artists like suing them for plagiarizing their work because they see images that come up that are very like similar to a particular artist's style. You know, on on the one hand, it is taking data without artist consent and not sure that's actually breaking a rule, but it kind of feels like it should be. On the other hand, it's because it's not stored in a database, it's not like cut paste in, in a traditional sort of way. It's kind of more analogous to a person looking at images and then that changing their perception of what art is and then them kind of learning to make that themselves, which is allowed, but does it change things if everything's at this like bigger scale and, and it can be done automatically at low cost it, or is just the, the consent issue like in just using the data uh, a problem in the first place? What was that lawsuit lost, lost against, uh, was it Blurred Lines for sounding too much like um, Marvin Gaye? <laughs> so I wonder if you could sort of use similar precedents. Yeah, even if it's not directly copying just by the fact that it was it created something similar. This is a, a place where technology is moving faster than the law. And so, uh, but that actually is a big uh, consideration here. So for a lot of any game developers here, don't use mid journey or other AI generated stuff in games that you intend to publish commercially. Steam will not allow it. If it detects AI generated stuff, it, it won't let you publish on the store, not because it's illegal, but because it might become illegal by the time your game is published. And Unless Steam doesn't want to deal with that. Or the creator. So if something comes up that it thinks is AI generated, then it'll it'll flag your game and won't really publish it. But if you can prove that you did in fact create it, because there's that issue from that now too many people have kind of issues where they're being accused of borrowing. That's that's gonna be a pain. I, I heard of someone on like DeviantArt or something, I uh, got their actually made art banned uh, because the moderator thought it was AI generated, but they are actually able to prove that it wasn't. Uh, my, my point there is is that like if you're thinking of using these kind of tools for publishable kind of things, the legality is still questionable. So it's not a good idea unless it's just prototyping or internal sort of use. Is there a question back there? And then I'll come up here. So when the humans are when the humans are like evaluating uh, responses, there's some kind of internal mental process that they're using to decide which response is the best. The whole goal of RLHF is to create like some kind of internal equation that sort of matches that sense that people are using uh, to uh, to rank things. And, uh, and it can get reasonably close, like a, a good enough to predict things like much of the time. Uh, but it's never going to be exactly the same. Like the the sort of ranking equation that, you know, is kind of forms in the neurons is never going to be exactly the same as what people are actually using to decide. And so because even if it's just like a little bit off, if it uses that and then that gets fed back in as, as information that drives further behavior, that little bit of divergence is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so you have to continuously ground it on reality, where reality here is what humans actually rank or value. If you go into solitary, you're going to diverge pretty quickly as well. Yes, quite heavily. Yes. And it's RLAHF is a is very much of a curated sort of process. The company making it. So in this case, OpenAI, uh, they would be uh, hiring people to to give these rankings. They'd be giving them some sort of instructions as to as to what they should rank. And in terms of like setting values of like what kind of things you should say, what kind of political topics you should avoid, again, that's going to be open AI deciding that. And that's something that a lot of people have, that some people have been concerned about in terms of like some company like pushing its values on everyone else. Now, open AI's goal here seems to be to try to be as uncontroversial as possible, but like you can't really be totally neutral and, and they're also they're human. And also a longer term goal is they'd like to make it more customizable so that uh, like it maybe has some default baseline, but then if you don't like the kind of answers it gives, you can kind of fine tune it yourself to give it more of the answers that you want. Uh, but then they have this trade-off between 
uh, letting people customize their system as much as they want versus, well, letting people customize their system as much as they want because they don't want to create like something that's optimized for hate speech because some of the view, uh, the users want that. Yeah, so actually there's separate concepts here. Yes, individual curation would allow people to style the kind of answers their, their AI gives to a much greater degree and uh, to personalize it. By memory, I'm referring to a more purely technical challenge of it just not taking into account things that you said earlier uh, and just like forgetting. Like I, I've used uh, I've used ChatGPT to like to help me like in like pair programming and like uh, trying to write an application in a computer language I didn't understand. It was like really good at first, and then later on it would like start getting into errors, and then it would fix those errors and create other errors, and then later it would like start creating the same error it was initially because that started to get outside of its context and it was like it, it couldn't cycle back. And I could solve that by putting that all together and writing a prompt saying, here's all of the things that you need to be aware of and so that it, it didn't have to rely on that as much. Okay, over here, if you still had it, then. Yeah, I just, but I just wanted to like kind of like round back because um, I think part of the memory problem that's kind of coming up is um, the need for vector databases. So I just wanted to mention that really quick. You were asking, how can you search the web using ChatGTP, and so you know ChatGTP was trained uh, in 2021, so it doesn't have new data since that date. And so, like, let's say you're designing a video game, and you have like all of this lore built out, and you want to generate like decision tree like conversations that are happening. Well, ChatGTP doesn't know about any of that documentation that you've created. The solution that's been come up currently is uh, that's like been created currently is the use of vector databases. So it'd be like uh, Pinecone, or there's another product called Alleviate that's currently uh, been brought up. And what it essentially does is it has a neural network. Like you, you, you provide it in like a, a model and you create embeddings for uh, a body of text. So you'll take a body of text and plug it into this model. And what it does is it gives you vector coordinates. So it would be something like 20,000 coordinates, like a single array with 20,000 numbers in it. Um, and they've been calculated based upon that model. And then what happens is you then, on a graph, like let's say you just had a two-dimensional graph, you're able to calculate, you have, you have two different points. You're, you're able to calculate the distance between those points. I think it's like a cosine um, equation. You know, that's with a two-dimensional graph, you're able to look at two different points and calculate how close they are. Now you let's say you have twenty thousand points. You're you're actually calculating the distance between two different vectors, like how close two different vectors are. So it would be body of text number one, and then body of text number two, and you're looking for how similar those two things are. So what you've essentially done from through that process of using a vector database is you've transitioned from using keyword search to semantic search, like. What's the meaning of the text outside of, you know, just the keywords that are in the body of knowledge? Um, and so, ChatGPT, sorry, ChatGPT provides um, in their uh, API. They provide a you can you can actually generate those keyword embeddings. And I think I, I haven't actually tried it yet, but I think you can provide the coordinates of those uh, embeddings to ChatGPT in order to like take an input text and then. Um, use it with ChatGTP, but I'm still kind of learning about it, to be honest. So, yeah. Two points I want to bring up on that, and I'll I hear yours to, to make some of that more accessible. First, yeah, a, a lot of the stuff, like we're talking about words that ChatGPT is using, but a lot of the stuff is actually going to be represented in like numerically so that like mathematical operations can be performed on it and you can get like how close things are to each other. The other thing that's actually important thing to know and not necessarily uh, obvious uh, about how it like, all its data only goes up to 2021. When you're using ChatGPT, that's it's not training on the answers you're giving it. I mean, maybe that'll be included in a future version. It is adapting to what you say in terms of it going into its context and it basically being like the earlier prompts are kind of part of your later prompts uh, in a conversation. So it's learning in that sense. But yeah, things that you write into it are not just going back into the model and updating all the weights and biases. 
in in the way that it was when it was pulling text off the internet uh, initially. Over here. So you framed the lack of memory as a problem. And I am challenging that by thinking it's actually an opportunity because from what you're describing with the weight, like the memory allows you to put weight or list weight on like, so basically it emphasizes a certain bias versus another, right? Based on the data available mm -hmm. and the feedback loops, right? Mm -hmm. So with our, like, I feel it's actually considerate not to have memory because Basically, what you're saying, if you have this skimming of data on the internet, you're just giving consideration to what's available now without consideration to accumulation of content over time. Like, not everybody has access to knowledge or AI in the world to contribute equally to mm -hmm. the, the accumulative thinking, mm -hmm. the human thinking. So, mm -hmm. I think of it actually as an opportunity to allow for more alignment with the reality with time mm -hmm. rather than a problem. Yeah, I, th I think a problem, if I use that word, the limitation would be the more accurate uh, phrase. And also with, with memory, that's also more limited to just you're having a conversation and it doesn't remember the things you said like 30 seconds ago. Um, it's I'm not lim uh, limitations on what data it can draw from in its database. Um, is, is a different question. And yes, uh, biases within that, in that the kind of text that's available on the internet is not fully representative uh, of the, the population. Uh, and that is a problem. Uh, you can, you know, biases show up, um, you know, gender, racial, that sort of thing, show up in some of the outputs uh, of various uh, AI systems. That's actually a surprisingly hard issue to, to issue to overcome because like, that's what it's learning from. And you can kind of tell it to move away from that. Um, but that typically looks like giving those sort of, as a large language model, I cannot answer this, you know, kind of thing, uh, which which often can have the side effect of decreasing quality of answers that have like not that are like seem to, that would seem totally unrelated because all of these all of these neurons are all interconnected to each other. And if you change one thing, no matter how good that change is, like it, it affects everything else. It's also a core problem, uh, what's called a data misgeneralization. When you run an, a uh, an AI system and it doesn't do what you want. There's two categories of problems that, I, that, that often get used. One is capabilities and one is um, what's often called alignment. Uh, capabilities problem is where it doesn't get, it gets a lot of error or it doesn't get a good reward or any of those, like by its own standards, it doesn't do very well. And then alignment is it does very well, but it's not what the person making it wanted it to happen. And the two sources of like alignment type issues, uh, one is if the goal wasn't specified very well and accomplishing that is actually not so great. And another is uh, that which gets to what you were talking about, uh, as I understand it, is that if the data in training isn't representative of the, of the larger world, uh, then it's going to generalize incorrectly. As far as I know, the best answer to that is get more and better data, which hopefully happens. But that's a, that's kind of like an economic problem from the perspective of the companies making it. Um, I, I actually have a question about the ML agents implementation. Sure. You talked a lot about sort of the, the theories of data training. And I am wondering how this works with like, like, does it train while it's going? Is it does it have to stop and do back propagation? How do you actually make it work? Sure, I'm gonna. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll plan to to get to that at the end. I'll show an example of one actually running uh, in training uh, with with one of my examples. But uh, before that, I'd like to just uh, show a couple of a, a showcase of some of the things that are done in um, that the e examples uh, I have for fully trained models. So this is one using physics for walking. And you can actually change the speed that it goes at. Wall jump right here. Uh, this deals with the problem of sparse rewards or things that are like hard to find. Uh, so right there, it had to push a, a, a wall, a block up to a wall to jump over it to get to the green thing. And that green target is the only thing that gives it any reward. And that would be a hard process for it to find randomly. So it starts out by... It's, it has three different environments. One of them, there's no wall. It can just move directly to the target, which you just saw there. Uh, and then there's some where there's a small wall, which it can just jump over. 
And then there's some where it's yes, it has to push the block. And so this demonstrates something called curriculum learning, where you give it a simple environment, it trains on that, and once it reaches a certain average reward, it moves to a slightly more complicated environment. And now it's already most of the way there, so it doesn't have as much to explore and can figure that out. And so this, yeah, this has those three levels. Next is pyramids. So right now there are no rewards anywhere in the scene. If it touches the button, one of the pyramids will get a green block on top of it, at which point it has to knock, it has to run into the pyramid so that the green block falls down and then it can pick it up. That is, would be way too sparse for it to just find that uh, accidentally. So the way this one works is it was rewarded for, for curiosity. Whenever something happens that was different from what I expected, it gets a small reward for that, and which diminishes over time as it gets more used to it. So this causes it to find things that are a little unusual in the environment, such as running into a pyramid and like, oh, your blocks are falling over the place. And until it's eventually able to get to a place where it's able to find the reward more consistently. Oh, and this one, it got a little bit confused. Oh, there. Is it going to make it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> This is the push block collab, uh, showing multiple agents working as a team. How long did it take to train these things? Yeah, no. These are these are official examples, so I'll go over the more like specific training process. What that that looks like uh, next. Uh, so yeah, here's we have these blocks that are of different weights, and it requires that number of agents to be able to push them. So uh, they need to work together to get a two. The yeah, ones are go easily. Uh, that's. All right, now, now they all have to join forces to get three. One on its own. Oh, no, not enough. They're fighting. <laughs> all right, almost. There we go. So there are some questions about what does the, the training process look like? So I'll bring up a example of, uh, this is a setup that uh, I had built. This is just move to the target. Get a get a penalty for hitting the wall or timing out. You know, too many steps. Uh, positive reward for reaching the target. And I also am using discrete action space. So rather than moving continuously like those previous examples were, it moves like in increments uh, on those in those little squares like this. So here we we see a fully trained thing. It just starts in a random spot and moves to the target, not completely straight. Um, but is able to work most of the time. Now we'll see if I can get this to train. So one trick to make training go faster is to have multiple environments active at once uh, and then uh, train them all at the same time. Uh, let's see, I'll zoom out a little ways. Okay, and for that, I have to set up the command line and get into the right spot and start a tell it to start a, a learning session. ML agents learn run idea unity PDX. And yes, that that's when I get this, that means it worked correctly. Get the little ASCII unity. So now I'm starting a new training run. And all of these agents are moving initially randomly. The reds are when it runs into a wall. Purple is when it times out. A green is when it reached the target correctly. Is there agent have knowledge of anything in the same when the same starts? Okay. So the knowledge that each agent has is its local position in its little grid, and also the target's local position. And its action space is it can move left, up, down, right, or stay still. Um, and we can see already we're starting to get a little bit more of the green, uh, which means that it's starting to get a little closer towards figuring it out. Uh, we can also see in the command line, uh, periodically it gives a report. So at step 50,000, uh, its mean re reward is 1.37. Can you speed up the process by adding more panels? Or is that the way it's designed? Or just, well, 
so I made there be 15. Yeah. Uh, it might speed up a little bit if I added more. At a certain point, like it, you can't just have, like have a thousand panels and make it, you know, learn super fast. And most of Unity's examples have about nine. So I, I don't know where the upper limit is there. Um, like it, it has to actually repeat a certain number of times. And actually what we're seeing right here is like crazy fast. I was showing this presentation to a group of like um, people who had a strong machine learning backgrounds, but didn't know anything about what Unity was. And they told me like the process that you just saw right now would have taken several hours uh, with something, with, even with an environment this simple. And the more complicated like soccer ones would have like, oh, that's running my computer for a week. Um, so, but that is a thing to consider. Like when you're used to just regular programming and game design, like you just hit test over and over and over again. And like, cause it, it only takes a few seconds. Uh, but when you're running stuff with ML agents, like you need to be very precise in how you set up your tests because each one takes a little while. Um, so I'll typically have two projects going, uh, an ML project and one that isn't and switch over the non ML project when it's training. Uh, but actually, it right now, it's pretty good. It's like if I stopped it here, it probably wouldn't lose much, uh, but it'll stay on this diminishing returns for a while until it feels like its reward is uh, average reward isn't changing very much, and then it'll just stop on its own. Um, so is it running the simulations in batches and then doing like a batch backpropagation or is it like every single one of those tests gets applied to the model? Uh, yeah, so all of these are kind of simultaneously feeding in to the model as it's going. Uh, and so that they're all they're all contributing to the same model, even though they're different runs. Um, in terms of where the backprop when the backpropagation actually happens in terms of the reinforcement learning, my guess is that it's per episode. So like each time an episode ends, like there's there's going to be some changes uh, to the weights and biases that affects all of them. Is this all done through like the Unity ML agents, or are you writing out your model in like PyTorch or TensorFlow or something? All in the Unity ML agents. Um, so I construct. I'll, I'll show you the, the what the code for this looks like uh, in a moment. I think. Actually, since you already saw a fully trained version, I, I don't need to feel like I need to let this run all the way to the end. The things to note, yeah? What are we expecting to see? Like, when do you know it's done? It just stops. Basically, the other thing we were expecting to see was that the rate at which it was successful gets to be like most of the time, which we were seeing there because like they were all turning green. And the end result of that is in a trained environment on the agent, we get this. So when you run a training uh, scenario, it generates this uh, this model file down here. And then you can plug this into the agent and then have it uh, use that to control its actions. Uh, and so this, so when I'm running it now, this is the, the version that I run it ran a moment ago. Anyway, the, the version I was showing a little little bit ago where it was just kind of moving slowly uh, at the beginning, that was not training at that time. It was using training data from an earlier run, which is stored in one of these files, which you just we just plug in there. Now, in terms of how this is actually built, like what I'm seeing as a developer uh, in making this, uh, this is the primary script. There's a few others dealing with score and changing the color in the background and, and and detecting collisions and so on. But the real meat of it is here in the agent itself. I have some variables to set the speed, how long it takes to reset, uh, some default values for what reward it gets under various conditions. These are just some references to targets. And at the beginning, uh, at each episode, we set a random placement for the agent and for any of the targets involved. That's when some other stuff when the episode starts. And then as it's running, because uh, I want it to be like a turn-based sort of thing, I have a coroutine to delay uh, every bit of time. At each increment, it calls this request decision, which is built into Unity's ML agents. So that uh, a decision uh, collects some observations and then 
performs an action. Collect observations, this is called externally uh, through the agent's system. And here we add observations to a sensor. So it's its own X and Y position and the X and Y positions for each of the targets. Then a frame or whatever bit of time passes or later in the frame, we get an on action received. Again, this is generated by the agent, by Unity's agents. This is a set of actions. So these are discrete actions, uh, a couple sets of them. There's, so there's two of them. One of them uh, can get either a zero, one, or a two. If it's a zero, it stays put. If it's a, uh, let's see, left, if it's a one, then it moves left. If it's a right, it moves right. And then on the second set of actions, uh, so this happens in parallel, it can go stay down or up. This section right here is what chooses its movement. Uh, where it gets these discrete actions is the magic of the you know neural network model. But then I just use them to translate its choices into actions that actually affect the game world. Uh, there's some trigger kind of stuff for detecting a target in a wall. Then, depend then depending on what's happened, uh, it adds a reward. And that reward I'm calculating right here. So if you hit a target, then give it the target reward. If you hit a wall, get the wall reward. If it's a timeout, get the timeout reward. And that gets that gets sent back and thrown into this add reward. Again, this goes to Unity ML agents, which it records. And then when we end the episode, that I think is when all the weights and biases get updated and the that little mini environment resets. Did that answer what you're getting at? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you can see here that like, oh, uh, one other thing that, that's worth noting is heuristics. In testing these, one thing that can be very helpful to see what's going on and whether your, your thing is solvable is, let's say in agents, I can set the behavior type to heuristic only. And let's see, I'm going to zoom back in. And in heuristic mode, it doesn't move on its own, but I can press the keyboard commands to move it around. Or if I can run at the wall and so on. And this is a good way to test whether your environment's like actually solvable and also uh, you know, how good of a reward you're able to get in comparison uh, to, a, to a trained model. And so that, that gives you an idea whether it's fall, fallen into a local minima or it's specification game or some other guesses as to what's going on. Question uh, there? Well, how performant is it? Like, can you have, how many agents can you have going at any one time? For training, it was kind of what you just saw uh, when I was when I was running it. And that, that takes a while. Once it's trained, it's very performant. Uh, probably maybe a little bit more expensive than if I'd written code to like, move closer to it, you know, calculate the direction, find the closest one. Uh, Cause it's, it's just running a bunch of floating point multiplication. There's probably for a, a network like this, there's probably not that many neurons in it. Train models run very fast. They run the GPU? It can. Right now I have not, I don't have the GPU set up to run this. And it only sometimes offers a benefit for larger training runs that, and if you're like really serious about it, there is, there is a GPU option. There's some additional setup steps. The, the benefit of running it on the GPU is it's more parallel. And that's really useful for the training process uh, to speed it up potentially. Uh, but it doesn't have to. So like what you just saw there of it training in this environment in like five minutes, that was on the CPU. It's not rendering the environment during the training. It seems like it'd be wasteful. The neural network, I mean, it, it is in the sense that you just saw it, you know, rendering on the screen. It is not as far as the neural network is concerned. The uh, machine learning aspect of it is only looking at the observations that I specified in code. It's that X and Y placement of the agent and the X and Y placement of the target. So it's four numbers. So you've separated out the, the physics simulation from the graphic rendering? Yes. In fact, this is in fact the as far as the machine learning agents is concerned, it's not even it doesn't even care about the physics. Uh, it's just it, its world is four positions of observations and then two integers of output and a reward signal. That is the entire universe that it sees. 
that, that doesn't it need to, if it's doing reinforcement learning, doesn't have to say, well, I move here, now what do I see? And I move there, now what do I see? Yes, it's, it's, in addition to those, it's recording like histories and that sort of thing. But every moment in history is just those observations, the actions, reward signal. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't care about the color or oh, yeah. or all the walls or any of that any of that kind of stuff. In fact, it doesn't even know the walls exist. Uh it just knows that sometimes when it moves to certain positions, it gets a negative reward or that or the episode resets. There was a question that's, here. That's a question. Yeah. Um so that that's part of why it's able to run so fast is like you it only works with the information that you explicitly give it. I think there is a mode where you can have it watch the screen, uh, but that's much slower, and I've never used that. I'm not sure why you would. How black box is the uh, is the system that they provide? It's basically. I mean, I think what Unity creates here is really just an interface. Uh, like there aren't really any capabilities here that you wouldn't get from running like PyTorch. So all all Unity does is uh, give you a nice interface where you can uh, integrate where you can train and integrate things into a game in a way that doesn't require having a, a strong ML background. Yeah. Uh, like I have a high school student who I like teach programming to and he had no trouble building an example like this. Actually something like this here in like continuous space, there's like a one hour code monkey tutorial from downloading it to having something running. Um, and that's, that's what Unity provides. The neural network part of it, like that's a black box, but that has nothing to do with Unity. That's just how neural networks are. And the uh, the trained model, it looks like is just a YAML file. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, there's a configuration file that you can mess with, uh, but you generally don't need to because the defaults are fine. So what kind of applications are better to use uh, ML versus just like traditional programming? Like kinds of problems are you, are you solving with this versus just you know programming the you know to close the distance between the keyboards? Yeah, that's a good question, and I guess the the, the last one of the last slides uh, that I had uh, planned. So basically, I kind of I have this concept that I like called uh, which I refer to as horizontal versus vertical complexity. Horizontal is where you have a large web of relationships, ideally like lots and lots of inputs that are all interrelated to each other in like weird, weird ways. And then there's vertical complexity, which is like a long, precise series of instructions, maybe not very many inputs, uh, but like you have to chain them together with a lot of inferential steps. ML agents is a good fit for the horizontal type of complexity. So like, say you have thousands of different inputs and you're, you're trying to relate them together. This example that I just showed you, that, that would be a terrible place to use ML. It would be so much easier to just code it. Use it to find patterns, not to find algorithms. Like if you have a very precise thing that you want it to, that you want it to do, just tell it that. But if you have just a bunch of tons, of, lots and lots of data and you want to find the patterns in it, then it's a good fit. And, and then also you combine this with the fact that like in, in game development, you generally want something specific. Boss monsters in Legend of Zelda, for example, they're very mechanical and that's by design. They could make them less so, but it's more fun to, if you can like try to figure out the patterns and then exploit them. And then that's how you, you gain skill. If it was more chaotic, it just wouldn't be as good of a game. And then that points to like, there's a specific thing you want to have happen, which makes ML not a, not a very good case. So for the most part, I would say that ML agents are not very good for the obvious use case of NPCs uh, or like enemies in particular. It's probably better to use code for that so you can control it. Uh, and also because the pattern tends to be one more of like that vertical sequential kind of complexity. What's well, like a, a non-obvious <laughs> So uh, like lots of things outside of games, like we mentioned image, image classifiers, large language models. Uh, one actually other form, which I, I want to get to before I end, uh, that Unity has, which is less publicized, but probably more useful for like a NPC in a game or like an opponent in the racing is actually imitation learning. You run it and you record yourself playing the, uh, the application for like five, 10, 15 minutes, whatever. It observes your beha behavior and then uses supervised learning to try to copy those actions when it's in similar states uh, and, and basically tries to imitate you. Now this 
runs into problems because it gets that issue where it's like not quite accurate. And then when it gets a little bit off, it gets further off and gets into states it hasn't seen before. And then it gets totally stuck. So you can combine that with reinforcement learning. So you use the imitation to get kind of close to where it should be and reinforcement learning to optimize it a little bit to get out of stuck points and maybe get a little bit better. And you get those two together, then you have something that can kind of act a little bit more like how, however you demonstrate it. Um, so that's potentially useful. I, I haven't seen that used much, uh, so I can't say that it actually works. I'd have to give that some more thought for other good uh, ML examples back there. Hmm. Yeah. So for that, I for debugging, I would think it would be better to use some other kind of automated process for trying all sorts of different things that the user might try. So something like a like a Monte Carlo kind of search, uh, where you just like at each choice, pick something at random and, you know, just randomly go through every sort of path that you could in the game just to, and then have some way of flagging when there are problems, but having something that's like trying to solve it. I, I'm not sure if that would really get much of a benefit uh, from a, from a debugging standpoint. Okay. I was wondering for the, you were showing heuristic learning and then you were also, or like heuristic playthrough, um, but it, when you were talking about that first instance where like it had not seen its incentive yet, is it possible to use heuristic learning to provide like a first run through that's like manually provided and then provides the initial incentive? Um, or like the, the initial training for like the first like few rounds or something? Not quite. That that's that's where you would use uh, imitation learning uh, and you know the behavioral cloning to to get those initial run throughs. A heuristic basically overrides ML saying like, don't use machine learning, just, just use player controls. Uh, but it's set up in a way that like the user controls kind of mirror what the ML system would be working with in terms of like what it can see and what it can do. And, and it does a little bit to like enforce that. Uh, so really the value of it is like, say I built an environment that was just impossible to solve. And then I run the ML agent and it doesn't solve it. And I'm like messing around like, well, why isn't this figuring it out? Did it fall? Like, no, it's because my environment's no good. And a heuristic is a way that you can you can test that. Like if you can't solve it, the the ML agent's probably going to struggle too. Gotcha. So you're saying, sorry, uh, you're essentially saying that, um, I forget the name, it's not mimic learning, it's- uh, Imitation learning. Imitation learning. Yes. Learning. Like is one of the parameters that you set the degree to which it can deviate from what you've done or is it just- the the increasing amount of rewards that drive like deviation from the original pattern. Yes. So uh, pure imitation learning just tries to copy you. There are parameters you can set to kind of balance pure imitation with reinforcement learning. And so you can say like what kind of trade-off it, it takes between those two. Uh, so whether it's like mostly optimizing with a little bit of imitation or mostly imitation with a little bit of optimizing. Uh, that that's something you can control and there's like a config file that you can set things for that. Go very quickly, just some pro tips for using this. Prefer positive rewards over negative rewards. So that example that I gave of the ball moving towards that target on the platform and it was just rolling off really quickly. The way I ended up solving that was take away the negative reward for the time step and instead slowly decrease towards zero but never reaching the reward based on how long it took. Uh, that way, it's always gets a positive for reaching the target, always gets the same negative for falling off, uh, but the time still matters, but not in a way that, that gets it stuck. Break complex tasks into stages with small rewards along the way if you can. And if there isn't an obvious way to do that, use the curriculum learning, like that wall jump example. Then last, I also mentioned, this is kind of outside the scope. All of this stuff in reinforcement learning assumes that you know what the goals are. There may be some cases where the actual goals, what you want to happen is kind of complex. And there is this system in machine learning called uh, inverse reinforcement learning, which observes behavior and then tries to infer reward a reward system from that and then optimizes for those inferred rewards. Uh, an example where I've heard of this being used is in self-driving cars, uh, where like a lot of the nuances of what people value when they're driving, like, yeah, you don't want, you want to get to the destination, you don't want to run into anything, but like what speed should you go at all times? And like how, when should you yield? And there's all kind of nuances that, that 
shape uh, people's decision making on that. And so uh, IRL is a is a way to learn that a, a little better. Uh, that's not built into Unity, but I have heard of someone working in self driving cars setting that up in Unity, like you know creating their own system for that. Uh, and that's something that I'm personally interested in. Okay, that is everything. So yeah, thank you very much for the attention and all the all the good questions.